Farming Sunday is brought to you in association with Farmers Weekly. Working for your farming future. Coming up on Farming Sunday. We've cultivated at least 15% more than we would have done with a wheel tractor without any auto steer or auto guide. I always say to people when I try and talk to them about food, could you do me a favour and, and try and understand where one thing you put in your gob comes from once a week? Because I don't think most people do. They wouldn't know where their butter comes from, they wouldn't know where their eggs come from, they wouldn't know where their chickens are coming from. The fertiliser spreader is now controlled from the Vario terminal within the tractor cab, so you don't have to have any separate boxes or anything. But, but in terms of the, the, the original purchase of the spreader, it did give us quite a good um, saving on the, on the cost. Worth Farms um, operates on a, a base locally of 4,500 acres. We're predominantly producing potatoes, anywhere between 14 and 18,000 tonnes of potatoes per year, depending on the land base that we're operating on at any particular time. We're producing sugar beet for British sugar. Uh, we're producing vining peas for um, Aldwych Marsh Cooperative. Um, wheat is a very important break crop. Um, this year, just over 1,600 acres um, sold through Centaur. And um, we're also renting land out to specialist growers producing salads uh, and uh, brassicas. We farm on alluvial silts. Um, these these um, soils, these silt soils, were um, were the original seabed, and they were a seabed a thousand years ago. Uh, they've been farmed for about 400 years. Has varying characteristics. There's there's light and heavy patches of of land. Um, it's easy to work um, compared with the clay soils, but we can get compaction uh, and compaction very quickly. Um, if we work the soil and bring the fine silts from from below the plough base um, to the surface we can get capping so it can be an issue in the spring when it, we, we, we're drilling um, small seeds like sugar beet or indeed in the past in carrots and we get a heavy rain very soon after drilling the soil can cap uh, and, uh, and stop the seeds getting through and reduce our plant populations so whilst it's a very fertile and easily workable soil uh, it, does have, um, it does have problems. We've used track machines for just over seven years we've, we've actually had them on demonstration from, from many years ago and we was always waiting uh, for the time when we had um, the workloads and we could justify um, that additional expense but seven years ago we, we purchased the first um, track machine uh, a John Deere um, 8400, very happy with that machine uh, and, and today we're running three uh, track machines, um, two Challengers uh, and one John Deere. Uh, the Challengers came on the farm about four years ago, the original ones have now gone um, and we have uh, in the last 12 months um, replaced those. Very happy with the, uh, the work rates and the improvement they have given us uh, on our soils. It's noted by people who have known these soils for many, many years that since introducing track machines and wider cultivators and different um, cultivation systems that the soil has improved. We've got less wet holes and the soil structure is much improved. Can you just go through some of the, the technology that's on board in the cab, for instance? We've tried to make the driver not only have control of the product at his fingertips, but also have comfort whilst doing the same thing. So the seat itself uh, has the armrest incorporated into the seat, so that wherever the driver is going within the seat, the, the armrest is following him. That's giving him full control at his fingertips. We have a TMC screen. The TMC screen itself gives you all the functions and controls of that tractor in one area. So, for example, that has a dial on it if you want to dial up what the linkage uh, needs to be set to or a setting particular setting on the linkage you'll dial up the linkage control then you'll have sub menus within that that you can pre-program then the linkage to operate as, as the customer wants it to, to operate uh, 
There's much more technology basically behind the engine and the transmission because the two talk to each other to get the most efficiency out of the machine. So it will it will give you some indication of which gear you want to be in across the field to be give you the best economy of fuel. Uh, it will also give you the torque ratings and the type of fuel ratings that the machine is using at any one particular time so you can drive it as efficiently as possible. Uh, it's got memories so that you can take into account field data uh, and then obviously plug and play options like auto guide uh, that will give you cost savings by uh, traveling the most efficient way across the field and also the least amount of overlap. Can you tell me how you see uh, the use of challenges and auto guide in improving efficiencies in, on the farm? Yeah, um, some manufacturers would, would claim a 3% saving um, with using auto steer systems. Um, we've now been operating for several years and particularly um, when it comes to wheat drilling, uh, I've gone out and I've measured before and after and I can, I can assure farmers on this farm we've, we've improved efficiencies by at least 3%. And 3% um, saving by not over cultivating, not over drilling on this farm is about 50 acres a year. So I'm confident that we are actually um, we're reducing our cultivations and our drilling by at least 3% by using auto guide. And remember, that's not just on the drill, that's on the cultivations before. And that's just one operation on this farm, 50 acres. Uh, with fuel as expensive as it is and wanting to get seed rates correct uh, and then wanting the, the, the sprayer and the expensive fertilizers like nitrogen to follow accurately afterwards, um, I am confident that we have improved um, efficiencies by at least 3% on this farm throughout our, our cereal operation. And how has that changed what the, the actual driver is in the cab? What's, what sort of alterations have you seen there? Yeah, the, the alterations um, that the driver has is that in the past he would spend probably 90% of his time concentrating keeping square and straight. Um, but today he can, he can use uh, almost 100% of his time, use that 90% of the time, um, operating his machine. So he can be looking at depth control, he can be looking at blockages, whatever he's doing, he's operating and managing his machine and not concentrating on steering. How have you found operating the challenges? Very nice machine, and put together fairly well, it runs lovely. The suspension has made a lot of difference, especially when the land dries out and it's fairly hard and you're running across it at a fair speed. It's a lot better for the driver in the cab than it used to be years ago with the wheel tractors or the earlier track machine with no suspension. I think the suspension is a, a big plus point on it. And in terms of actually using it, I mean, things like Autoguide, how has that helped? Oh, yes. Um, in the early days, I wasn't uh, too pleased with it because um, I actually drilled cereals uh, and pulses and different things on the farm. And I used to... Um, pride myself on keeping straight and leaving the straight lines because obviously they're, they're there for a long while for people to see and I, I, I thought that the, the auto guide was a little bit of a threat to um, people like myself but no uh, I'm afraid I was wrong it's a very very good piece of equipment um, and you can actually I can operate my, my seeding machine my drill a lot better now because the tractor is driving itself in a straight line and it is very very good you, you know I prided myself on going straight but I cannot compete because it's a railway line it's very very good. You mentioned the GPS system um, why did you choose an RTK system? Um, we spoke with, uh, with various manufacturers about um, uh, having our own base station uh, we spoke to, to Agco and we were moving towards the Challenger tractor and um, we, we were very happy with DGPS, we were very happy with the signal, but what we wanted to do was to improve that. We knew that there was a better signal and also that, that it would become more reliable, but more importantly, that we'd got control of it on the farm um, and that we were reducing cost over time. We, we were paying um, for a DGPS signal every year and this way we've bought into it once and now we're benefiting from it uh, for a long time to come. So we've got everything. We've got a reduced cost. We've got a perfect signal that's repeatable, that doesn't wander, that doesn't degrade over our farming base, uh, and um, therefore it's it's very efficient and it's financially right. 
So bottom line, what do you see the benefits of both auto guide and also using these challenges? Um, the benefits overall um, on pri primary cultivations over time I think my, my team would agree with me that we improve our cultivations by at least 15% over the season. I'm quite happy to state that sort of figure uh, on a daily basis because of fatigue, um, matching bouts, um, the, the field operations that we can employ with field procedures um, and the confidence that it gives the guys to actually make the best of that well-balanced machine um, I would say at the end of the day we've cultivated at least 15% more than we would have done with a wheel tractor without any auto steer or auto guide. And what are the benefits do you think the challenges give you? The challenges are, are very powerful, um, a very uh, balanced machine, um, their traction is superb, the reliability has been second to none, um, the resale values have been good so as a package uh, with a backup from Agco and our local dealer has been very good. Um, it's a very efficient unit and the drivers um, like them immensely. The restaurant we built here in Smithfield was uh, inspired really by the meat market, the meat market which has sat on this site since 1500s. Um, and what we wanted to try and do was to build a restaurant which was egalitarian, available to everybody um, on different levels so you could sort of move your way up through a building and it sort of gets more and more fancy, more and more sexy and more and more expensive I suppose as you go up with the top level being absolutely completely dedicated to the greatness of British beef. And what we do on the top floor is we have a fine meat list, primarily rare breeds, um, very little organics, but a lot of ancient breed, rare breed, with complete provenance. You've recently been appointed the president of the Royal Agricultural Society. How did that come about? I take up my presidency for the um, RESE, the Royal Agricultural Society of England, on the 1st of October. And it came about from a chance meeting between Prue Leith and Hugh Oliver Bellasis. Um, Hugh Oliver Bellasis is the um, acting chairman for the society. Prue Leith is a sort of great doyen of, of um, British food and restaurants and training of people. And uh, they were out in Vietnam and chatting away and Hugh was saying how he found it difficult now with the society and trying to move the society into the modern age and get young farmers and restaurateurs and various people involved in it. And apparently Prue turned around to Hugh and said there's only one person who would do it and it's an Aussie and he's the one who's got a big mouth and he'll go and scream about it and you should get hold of him. So he came and saw me and asked me if I'd do it and I said absolutely, yeah, I think what an honour, so of course. And I think it is an honour, I think as a, as a young Aussie, um, although I've been here for a long time, as a restaurateur, as a young chef, to be involved in a society which is about the motivation of great food in this country and farming and agriculture, I think is, you know, is, a, is an extraordinary thing. And what sort of things do you think the Rays can actually achieve in terms of putting the, perhaps the, the, the provenance of British food to the greater general, general public? Well, I think the RASE as a society have got a huge job to rebuild confidence amongst the farmers that they will actually achieve something. Um, the greatest thing that happens in the, the sort of celebration of the, the calendar of, for the RASE is the Royal Show. And sitting next to me right now is a group of people working towards trying to make the show something absolutely extraordinary again, as it should be, a celebration of everything great in agriculture, um, but also in food. And what we're going to do is try and promote food as much as possible so that there is something for the urban community to relate to the rural community. Because for me, there has to be a communication and a relationship between both communities before we can actually come together. So as far as promoting food goes, what we've got to first do is to get people to love food that is British. And that's happening slowly. That's been a really long, hard slog. But I think people are now really passionate about great British produce. They, they you know, starting to look for it in the, in the shops. They're starting to get a lot more farmers markets. They're you know, thinking about where their food is coming from a lot more. Um, so we as a society have to continue to drive that and get the farming community to talk to the urban community to make the whole thing sort of explode and celebrate what's great about British food. And do you think the urban community understand where their food comes from? 
I think the average Londoner, the average um, Mancurian, um, Scouser, um, would probably have no idea where most of the food comes from. Uh, I always say to people when I try and talk to them about food, could you do me a favour and, and try and understand where one thing you put in your gob comes from once a week? Because I don't think most people do. They wouldn't know where their butter comes from. They wouldn't know where their eggs come from. They wouldn't know where their chickens are coming from. Um, no, I don't think they do know. And because I think there's a cultural issue here, and this is where there's a massive difference for me between Australia and the UK. And do you think you've seen a change in that attitude since you've been in the UK? There's been a massive change since I've been in the UK. But there's a massive change, I think, around the world. You know, in France and Switzerland, they celebrated chefs. They were great people. When I did my apprenticeship in Australia at age 16, in the you know, 1980s, everybody thought I was slightly weird. I must be dumb or I've lost my marbles or there's something completely wrong. Chefs were not considered as being educated people at all. So that's changed. I think that the way people eat and the, pe the perception of food is very, very different. I think that uh, restaurants are now part of general life, they're not just about occasion. And when I say occasion, restaurants when I first got here were wedding anniversary, you know, your birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, that's the only time you went to a restaurant. Well that's changed. And if people say to me, no, 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 it wasn't like that, absolute rubbish, it was like that completely. And in certain parts of the country, it's still like that. Now that will take quite a long time to change, but rest, you know, people eat out as a matter of their daily life now. Do you feel the UK restaurant industry has used British food perhaps as it might have? UK restaurants, UK hotels, I don't believe have done enough in the past 20 years to support British food. And I, everybody knows I say that, I'm very, very happy to say it because I don't believe they have. I think that um, too many people have been buying French butter for a really, really long time. I think that people have been importing you know, all sorts of bits and pieces from Parma ham. Now, you import Parma ham, why aren't you buying off Richard Woodall in, in Cumbria? He makes the same stuff, in fact it's far, far better. So you know, there is a comparison all the way through. Um, French cheeses, well, suddenly everybody realises that you know, British and Irish cheeses are some of the best in the world. So it, I think that's taken a lot of work. Um, so I don't believe that they have, up until recently, really done enough to promote British food. I think they're getting better at it, and I think there's still a lot of work to go on. I think there's a few people out there shouting a big noise and not necessarily really delivering what they're saying they're supposed to be doing. So I think that's a bit of a shame. But I think, I think we're getting there, and I think that people are interested in it, and because the customer demands it, then we end up with a far, far better you know, system and, and people really trying to take it on. And at least restaurants now, most of them, are not importing asparagus, for God's sake. So if you can look forward a year, what do you hope you'll have achieved with the presidency over, over the next 12 months? I, hopefully by Christmas next year, I can look back, and as the honorary president of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, I can say to myself, I achieved one quite major thing within the food industry. Um, and I hope that's the introduction of British veal to the general public. I hope by the end of the year also that I would have had the ability to get the farmer to understand the chef and the chef to understand the farmer. And that's going to be, I think, quite a fun process. And that for me would be really, really exciting. If I can get a couple of chefs every single year to go lambing, get a couple of chefs to sit on a combine harvester, get a couple of chefs to go and work in a slaughterhouse. I think that sort of stuff for me will change the way that we as Brits, well, me as an Aussie, but the Brits, will start to consider food. Because then you've got more than people than just me screaming about the provenance of food. We've been here as a family since the late 1920s. My great-grandfather moved down from a local farm. Um, the farm itself here is 500 acres or so, and we rent in another 200 acres on, on a farm business tenancy from a local farmer who's since retired. Um, and then we also rent other land in annually for growing Chantonnay carrots and potatoes. Um, it's all the land that we grow root crops on is, uh, is irrigatable so we need to have water for the crops. Um, it's a family partnership, my father, brother and myself. And um, my brother 
chiefly looks after the diversification enterprises, the cross-country course and uh, all, the, all the, the equestrian side of things. Um, and I look after the, all the arable side of the business. What sort of machinery do you, do you tend to use? Um, we historically used or, or tried to use all our own machinery and our own labour. Um, we have cut down a lot with labour over the years now. Um, I do a lot of the tractor work, I do all the combining. So we run our own combine harvester, we run our own potato harvester, um, we run Fent tractors which we brought into the farm uh, in place of Massey Ferguson uh, four years ago. We'd run Massey Ferguson tractors for a long time so we run two full-time tractors and then we have a higher tractor which I use through the, through the summer. Um, that helps us a lot with fuel savings. Um, the only contractors we use really are for the carrot lifting and also for cereal drilling in the autumn and the spring. So, so um, we're busy doing other things so we don't have time to do the, 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 the uh, cereal drilling. All the new uh, sophisticated technologies that these tractors have on board, how can these help farmers become more productive? Well, one way that, that, that can help is that rather than treating the tractor and an implement as two completely independent units with their own control systems, their own electronics, that we can devise systems where my tractors and implements can talk together, they can be controlled together, and that's become possible in the last few years using a system called ISOBUS. Now, ISOBUS is a common standard, a common language that all farm machinery manufacturers have adopted. In practice, this means that we can then plug our implement, for example, a sprayer, for example, a fertilizer spreader, a baler, in fact, any kind of implement that, that uses electronic controls, straight into the back of the tractor using what we call the ISOBUS plug. And then we can actually monitor and control the, the implement using the tractor's own display console. And in terms of the technologies in the cab, how are you using them? Well, the, um, the, the, the gearbox uh, is the Vario gearbox, um, uh, CVT, Continually Variable Transmission Gearbox, um, which is, links with the fuel economy on there. Um, the Vario terminal now um, on our tractors has uh, the ISOBUS capability. So for some of the implements, for example, the fertiliser spreader, that is able to plug straight into the tractor. Um, we don't need to have a separate control box. Um, that actually gave us a, a saving when we purchased the spreader of, of a significant amount. Um, the software in the tractor just had to be pre-programmed and a new plug put on. Um, so um, the fertiliser spreader is now controlled from the Vario terminal within the tractor cab so you don't have to have any separate boxes or anything but, but in terms of the, the, the original purchase of the spreader it did give us quite a good um, saving on the, on the cost. What are the benefits to farmers in the field? Well the immediate benefit to the farmer in the field is that the, the tractor has got exactly the same plug on it as his implement has got on it and instead of requiring to have an additional control box inside the cab and sometimes you look at tractors and they may have three, four or five control boxes in the cab, uh, which obviously is going to impair the visibility, etc. We now can control everything through the tractor's own display module. And that means that the, the driver sits in comfort with the display module perfectly positioned where the tractor manufacturer has put it and can control the implement all through that one control box. So. There is a cost saving, but more importantly, a convenience that allows the, the driver to get the best out of the tractor and implement. How much do you think ISOBUS has saved you? Um, it, it, the ISOBUS system, uh, being able to link into the tractor, meant that we didn't have to have a control box. Um, there were two types of control box at the time. We would have had the more expensive one to get the, the best out of the machine. So that actually saved us in the order of about £2,500 over the new, new machine um, by, by being able to link that straight into the tractor. Um, we did have to do a software pro, uh, upgrade on the tractor but that was only a few, uh, a couple, I think it was a couple of hundred quid so overall it was quite a significant saving for us uh, and it makes the best use of the technology on the, on the tractor. Now at the moment that those technologies are more or less limited to just being able to monitor 
uh, and control the implement through the tractor's control systems, but in the future we can easily imagine that the tractor and implement would be working together much more closely. For example, with a baler, if the baler hit a, a tough part of the field, a heavy swath, the, the load in the baler increased and we needed to slow the tractor down. This could be done automatically rather than relying on the operator moving the, the control lever backwards and then speeding up again once the tough part had been passed. So just like we, we talk about the tractor has its own systems to control the efficiency and productivity in the field, we can imagine in the future using ISOBUS that both tractor and implement will be working together to again maximise that productivity, particularly when working in the field. So in terms of future machinery purchases, do you see ISOBUS and these technologies actually driving what you're going to buy? Um, Yes, to a, to a degree, uh, th there's other practical implications as well. In, for example, it wouldn't be quite so straightforward with a sprayer box. For, for you, you're limited with buttons and the, the, the actual tractor manufacturers have got to come on board a, a little bit more, I think. And Although it's supposed to be a very universal system, um, it depends a little bit on the machine you're using. I know Kverland have now got the ISOBUS technology, um, I think Anvadastat also on their drills. Um, uh, John Deere use ISOBUS, as do uh, New Holland, I believe now. Um, but um, I think there still needs to be a little bit more work done on um, standardisation, really. Um, but f for, for us, uh, certainly any new machinery purchase, it would certainly be a factor to look at. And in terms of recording the information that you, you gather from your day's work, how is that uh, synchronised? Well, ISOBUS is actually a language that, that not only the tractor and implement understands, but it also covers the language that's used by the PC as well. And it's been designed, therefore, as a standard that allows information uh, collected through the tractor and implement's own systems to be stored on the tractor, then downloaded, normally via an SD data card, and then taken back to the office and analysed and reports made of it by, by the farm office computer. And of course this, this technology is all designed to improve the efficiency, the productivity, at the same time reduce the costs of the professional farmer. Thank you for watching this week's show. Be sure to tune in at the same time next week. Please contact us with any comments or thoughts on information at farmingsunday.co.uk.